looks like your credits went through just fine. Fantastic. Now, where was I? Hmm, right, right. You were asking about the Mercs, Noxolaris. Well, friend, you have come to the right man. Been their humble street pharmacist since just after they got together. Some of my best clients, by the way. But more importantly for you, they're the best there is at what they do. I mean, what a group. Leaders are bona fide Atlantean voyager. That's right, Atlantean. Then there's the spooky techno wizard cyborg genius. Finally, a mystic smithy giant. Twelve feet tall if he's an inch. Not to mention the mountain of a spirit bear he calls brother. Now, I can get word to him if you're looking to hire mister. No problem there. Just let old Blitz give you two tiny tips for your health. First, don't get on their bad side. Make sure you have payment ready to go, and don't try to pull any bullshit, or you're worse than dead. And second, don't piss off that fucking bear. Finally, finally, there you are. <laughs> the Nexus had just enough power to fuel one more try. The last step. The Megaverse knows my Atlantean people as heroes, but I, a shadow of chaos has taken root in me. They try to bind it. They try to bury it. But when I finally called out to it, to you, from across the void, you answered, I am ready. Welcome, traveler. To the Black Shore. Your shame reaches a mother's heart, even beyond the veil, little brother. My sister saw her mocked her as the darkness closed in. She giggled and synthesized the honey sweet tones while leaning close to softly breathe her venom into my ear. And so, with judgment passed and tourniquets in place, my family commanded the automated surgical bots to neatly slice both arms and legs from my torso. The harsh lights overhead swam and dimmed before my eyes as flesh and bone were replaced with cold, unfeeling metal to cripple my connection to the arcane. No, my family lies far behind my path. And I follow a new teacher as she whispers from the darkness ahead. Her voice haunts me with promises of forbidden knowledge and wonders precious beyond compare. Each step brings me closer to my prize, closer to my revenge, closer to her. stars as keenly as your ancient ones do. It is almost here. E is almost home. And with him 
comes the end for our proud and noble Vana Country Month, along with the rest of the souls on this world. As his foul shadow falls upon us all, we alone stand for those who cannot. So rise, son of Aku. Our ancestors smile upon us this night as they call us home. Come and let us earn our place amongst the stars above. guys starting recording nice uh rename stream day share All right, guys, everybody set? I'm Indeed. Um, let's go. You still need a second, Dex? No, I'm good. I was okay. just uh, editing names on recordings, so I know what the fuck they are. No worries at all. <laughs> all right, I'm going to give it a couple of seconds of silence, and then we'll get started here. Yeah, I'm going to start now. Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Prism of Ketterfall campaign in the Rift setting on Roll20. We are back with our players, uh, Kilo, Dex, and Bear, who are playing their characters, uh, Ren, Akama, and Ymir. Um, where we last left off, uh, our intrepid adventurers had just... Uh, been stunned with this sight before them as they stood in a grand uh, ha a grand hall occupied by near cosmic level entities um, and were being gifted with the rare opportunity to see some of the denizens held within uh, this uh, arcane complex um, when we left off um, their view had just shifted to this horror, and as we start back up, um, this image is slowly fading away from their eyes, uh, leading them back to their surroundings in 
what appears to be the grand hall of the main facility. Um, they are still surrounded by uh, the wheelmen um, and a few other denizens of this area. Uh, the wheelman was the one who operated the great mechanism um, that turned the alcove they were standing in in on itself, sealing itself off inside the wall. Um, and once the alcove had spun, um, he used his wheel and crystal to open uh, essentially a, a gateway from what you were able to perceive. Um, sort of realigning reality to show you perhaps uh, different cells within this uh, grand facility. Um, okay, as your vision returns and your reality reshapes back to the main hall, um, you realize that the alcove, uh, the grinding of the wheel can be heard again and you realize that the alcove is uh, slowly turning uh, back out into the hall itself. Um, after this short experience, each of you uh, feels drained, um, not from the initial encounter with the grand uh, phoenix-like entity that was above you, the first entity that you saw, um, but as soon as it shifted to that last denizen, um, each of you felt the life force being drained away. Uh, not, not slowly, but rapidly, like a waterfall leaving your body. Um, this creature, when you viewed it, a, a kind of sense of primal peace and majesty washed over you. And uh, none of you felt any sense of real threat or danger in its in its uh, grand presence, although it did blot out most of the sky that you could see. Um, all right, as you guys return to the main chamber, uh, forward steps this individual again. Um, as he steps forward, now you see that there are half a dozen small uh opulent glasses set up on his tray um each one a different color um each uh each glass inlaid with filigree of a different kind of precious metal and uh inset with several precious gems and stones um obviously very expensive and refined um accoutrement for this for this place which most of what you've seen so far has been pretty sparse and spartan. Um, again, in the main hall itself, you guys have all noticed that it actually looks like there are some, uh, some kind of signs of battle, and there have been some supplies, uh, war gear and things like that, stacked up in piles around, um, almost, almost lending itself... Um, to seem like maybe this place is having to defend itself regularly and they're preparing for some kind of large-scale conflict. Um, you did each notice, though, that from the outside, this place doesn't really look like it has defenses. I mean, you guys saw several of those individuals uh, with the robes that, I mean, they were all holding basic tools. Nobody was even using anything that seemed to have a power source. Um, and other than their eye color... Uh, being a little bit uh, peculiar, you guys didn't really notice anything that that exceptional about them. Now you have encountered a few beings within this place um, that were that were apparently powerful enough to you know even give you guys some pause. Um, the large golem-like creature that stormed up from the lower floors um, was one such uh, entity. But against, like, aerial foes or numerous combatants, even something like that would just be overwhelmed. So, so yeah, it's definitely strange to you guys that you're not really, if, if they're getting ready for conflict, the fact that nobody's even set up a machine gun nest or, you know, sandbags or anything outside is definitely strange to you. Um, all right, as the individual returns with the drinks... Um, he begins to open his mouth to speak 
And what comes out is just a strange kind of reverberating, echoing, uh, uh, almost like a mechanical, um, uh, like a skipping noise. And you notice that he is moving his mouth as though he's using like a spoken language. But for some reason, none of you are understanding what he's saying. Um, he seems to he seems to be aware of this almost instantly. But um, I want you each to give me a perception check real quick. Uh, and just to refresh everybody's memory, you just need to go into your character sheet and go into the active profile. And in saving throws, you should have a die right next to um, perception check to roll. No, it's been a while since we've messed with all this stuff. Okay. Um, Ren, you notice right away that um, his mouth moving doesn't seem to have anything to do with the noise that's coming out. And you would guess that it's some kind of very sophisticated um, audio, almost like a, a coded cipher. Um, you're not familiar with this kind of technology or code, so you don't really pick up much more than that. But you would guess that somewhere on his person, he's got a pretty sophisticated like a, some kind of sound system that's able to articulate things like that for him on the fly. Um, you're not sure what the use of that would be, but one thing you do notice is that he's kind of squinting his eyes a little, and it makes you suspicious that he's actually trying to see if any of you can actually understand the noises that he's making. Um, Akama, you... I believe you have like, okay, you are able to suss out that you, you recognize these noises, although you don't understand them. You recognize them as a, uh, uh, a kind of language used by a species called the Talon. And from everything that you've heard in your travels, they are an extremely dangerous species of manipulators. Um, you don't really know much about their physical characteristics, but you have heard tales about the, the species using this kind of, of linguistic uh, uh, communication, that species being uh, responsible for the fall of a lot of different civilizations and kingdoms throughout the megaverse over time. Um, and when you make this connection, uh, I want you to go ahead and roll a mental endurance check. So let's see, we're going to do we're going to do PCs a comma and I just want to check on your profile and see if there would be a really appropriate save. So I think that you making a horror factor save would be perfect for this because you're kind of already mentally hardened against it. Um, so okay. why don't you go ahead and do a horror factor check. Plus two. Nice. Okay. So you are able to, at the same time you realize what his species is, species is, and what his background probably is, 
you realize that his eyes have narrowed and he's scanning over each of your faces in turn, trying to see if anyone can pick up, you know, on, on what this could imply about him. You pick up on exactly what it implies about him, but in that split second when before his eyes get to yours, you're able to steel yourself against this knowledge because it does definitely nice. it does definitely raise like the hairs on the back of your neck and send a chill, a primordial chill uh, uh, through your soul because any beings that are able to do this without being, for instance, like God level power, most of the time they're incredibly powerful psionically. They're, uh, you know, gifted in some way that maybe they can't just take over by fucking might, but they are just as dangerous as like some horror that rips through a, a rift and takes out an entire world. Um, so in that last split second, you're able to steel yourself against that fear. And when his eyes meet yours, you're sure that he doesn't pick up on what you've what you've realized um, as you guys are all watching. You see that uh, his eyes uh, seem to relax after after scanning each of you, and then a wide smile grows across his face. Um, and in, we're going to say English, um, uh, in a very basic uh, uh, dialect of it, um, he says, uh, you are most welcome uh to our inner sanctum and with this he holds the the platter out before him with uh like i said about a half a dozen drinks and really ornate glasses um as you guys look there's one of each kind of primary color um blue red green yellow you know all, all the standards um and each is decorated in its own kind of you know uh kind of style the glass but nothing about any of the drinks really looks that interesting. None of you pick up on any kind of real signs of nothing's bubbling. You don't see anything dissolved in the liquids. They're each a different colored liquid in a fancy glass. Um, does anybody wish to... to... Is there anything unique about the um, containers, glassware, or anything of any of them? Uh, as you're looking, you really don't see anything. They, the, again, they look, they look expensive. And very tasteful and ornate, but none of you are picking up on anything out of the ordinary about any of it. So no off smells, Ymir can't smell nothing. Anything. Okay. Zero. Okay. Absolute zero. Who's got like cola, sunny D, purple stuff? <laughs> Anybody gonna take one? Um, from my experience with anything of drinks, beverages, alcohol, which is probably not a whole lot, do I recognize anything? Does anything look familiar or is this all kind of other, or otherworldly looking to me? Uh, the, the one that looks blue to you kind of looks like juice. It, it looks a little more like juice than maybe just but like it's a, blue. But yeah, it's it's a little thicker, you would say. So, do I know of any blue fruit that could possibly do this, or does it look like it just looks like juice because of its texture and its thick, like yeah thickness? But the color wise, yeah. it doesn't match up. So, um, I don't know, I'm I, I'm gonna I'm gonna not. Okay. Anybody else? Oh my good sir, what kind of uh, flavors is these? Um. At this, he leans close, and his grin gets even more wide, and um, and his head just slightly tilts to the left, uh, and he says, "For you, Sir Atlantean, I would recommend the red." And he spins the the platter on its axis on his palm very deftly, and uh, instantly the red glass kind of appears right in front of you with the twirl and flourish. Um, as it does so, you see the liquid slowly slosh up uh, because of the force applied to it. And as it sloshes up against the edge of, of the glass, the rim, um, you can see that it, it catches the overhead lighting 
uh, just right so that you almost see tiny little glittering sparkles all throughout the liquid, almost as though it's made of a red dust of diamonds that moves more like liquid than a solid. Um, it's a fascinating kind of visual effect that catches your eye for a moment, um, and it definitely intrigues you. The Atlantean um, goal slugger. <laughs> he stands there with the same kind of grin and, and crook to his neck uh, in anticipation of you taking it. He seems very eager. Uh, I look at him and I say, who had concocted these uh, beautiful drinks? Um, his smile grows even wider and he says, why, good sir, I, of course, create all concoctions within this domicile. Refreshment and comfort are my business. And with this, he slightly bows his head in a, in a kind of gleeful nod. I look in Harmony to see if, uh, if it's a good to go or not. Uh, Harmony is actually turned around. Her and Pilgrim are uh, conversing kind of off to the side of you guys. And she's turned around, not engaged with him at all. Um, she appears to be talking very lowly, um, and they seem to be kind of uh, keeping counsel amongst the two of them right now. It seems as though they perhaps are discussing something maybe about the Grandmaster's uh, appearance or wishes. You're not sure. Gotcha. Uh, so I look at the uh, bartender, and I give a slight bow of the head and I say bear with me one second I'll be right back and then I rush off to uh, Pilgrim and Harmony okay you hightail it over there it's just a few feet away you arrive real quick let's cut over Ymir what are you doing Ymir has been watching the exchange between Akama and the Shall we just call him the ghostly bartender for now? I, I like that descriptor that, <laughs> that Akama works. used. <laughs> Watch the exchange between uh, Akama and the ghostly bartender. And he still, because of the the aura that, the gay, that his gaze gave out when his eyes met Ymir's, he's still very cautious. But seeing that Akama had a somewhat pleasant interaction with him, he... Walk, he walks towards him uh, out of respect, not trying to disrespect because he's clearly showing signs of be, trying to be a host, and that's universal. So Ymir just steps over to the ghostly bartender and bows his head uh, towards uh, his drinks, uh, maybe to imply what what would be there for him if he were to take one. Okay. So as you kind of saunter over, you, you kind of raise an eyebrow in speculation and a, and a kind of tilted back head gesture, almost inquisitively. And as, yes. he, as he notices this on your, on your uh, kind of primitive and chiseled features, um, he, simply, he simply nods with great deference and with a small quarter spin of the platter um, a yellowish beverage uh, quickly snaps into place right before your position. Uh, and that beverage, all you can all you can tell about it is that it looks more like light than it does liquid. You, you see kind of the glow that would be normal from liquid uh, in a glass like that under the current lighting conditions. Um, but you don't really see the physical signs of the liquid itself. You're seeing the ref reflections and refractions and all of that, but it it more looks like just a glass of of subtle light. So like uh, the fuel that they put into the uh, Winnebago that yogurt gives them in Spaceballs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that or I was thinking pure Marcellus Wallace soul. You oh know, yeah, nice. When you open up the nice, yeah, a briefcase soul. Yeah. yeah. You you oh, see the Moscow you see the cool. you see the wheelman has a band aid on the back of his neck, so <laughs> well, that makes sense. But um, <laughs> are 
is the Ymir looks at the go- or glass. Is this goblet strong enough for him to pick up himself without it shattering instantly? You talked about how it uh, most of these glasses seemed pretty delicate and um, intricate glassware. Is this glass just going to explode if fucking Ymir <laughs> tries to pick it up? As you as you're looking at this and contemplating it, um, you see that he leans forward over the the platter just a bit and um in a very gracious and and formal kind of cadence and droll he says uh good sir i am valet lopan g i assure you i would never harm any of our fabled and famed guests he says you are most safe here and i assure you as well you will cause no harm to anything that is offered please enjoy our hospitality and his his grin has faded he seems very formal and very earnest and sincere right now okay well given um given what the valet has just told him Ymir gladly accepts the cup of light, lifts it up off the tray, raises it up in his palm, and nods his head at him as a gesture of cheers, or skull, as a sign of respect for him offering the drink. He doesn't sip it, but he raises it to him out of respect, and he takes his leave and walks over towards uh, following a comma, following the direction of a comma. Okay. Um, so you take the cup, it definitely holds up to your to your huge ham-sized fists, uh, no problem at all. And as you walk over to their location, um, you see uh, the valet just kind of very crisply bow once to you. Um, he then kind of turns and looks at you, Ren, and he just he just kind of raises an eyebrow kind of quizzically like, are you sure you wouldn't care to partake? Ren's just too out of his comfort zone in most in most instances, but especially now he just yeah, like I believe Ren has an inkling to try something and maybe even somewhat believes what he had just said to him, but still that just nervous like, you know, completely fish out of water in most situations. Okay. And he'll just he'll just kind of shyly just shake his head like I'm I'm fine. Okay. And at this um as you do that your right arm at the elbow where the grandmaster had placed that band of strange silver um right at that joint your arm very savagely spasms and contracts and jerks snapping your elbow your your forearm close to your chest and kind of curling up your fist um and as you look down shot my right arm goes t-rex style arm like yeah, right spasm. it okay. yeah it just it it right at the elbow you feel like this this crazy twinge and it makes it kind of seize up your fist goes close to your chest plate and as you look down you see each of the fingers on that hand kind of spasming wildly for just maybe two seconds. And then instantly your arm feels basically numb and tingly from the elbow up to the tip of your fingers, which you're all, you know, you have a very um, complicated sense of tactile sensation because of your modifications. Um, so, but the entire area seems to go very numb for a moment and then within just three, four seconds, you feel sensation come back. And all basically of a sudden... from where my elbow would be, it'd be basically I'm getting sensor overload and then almost nothing for a second from my, my arm. And then I'm getting like kind of shocky little like tidbits coming back as slowly as it's coming. Yes, but it, it comes back over the span of only about three or four seconds. So it, it comes back yeah. very quickly. Um, at this, you just casually look back up to who you were paying attention to a moment ago and you see that his eyes are focused 
very, very firmly on what he just saw transpire with you and your arm. And yeah, see, I'm automatically assuming that he was responsible for me not accepting that drink. I'm very now, now I, the little bit of comfort I just had is <laughs> gone. Cause I'm thinking he was somehow controlled that by me refusing a beverage. So at this, at this, he just kind of looks at you, uh, in that same kind of intense way, but really doesn't have any other sign of emotion or intention on his face. He's just staring at you now and you're kind of there by yourself <laughs> in front of this guy. Just, just standing there. What would you like to do? I'm going to try to join a comma and, um, Ymir. All right. Because I am, I am now weirded up by this guy completely. <laughs> All right. So you turn around and you start heading back over. Um, let's see. All right. Well done, guys. It's like a so... little kid being like, oh, I think this dog is nice. And then the dog barks at something <laughs> not related to you. And that kid's like, nope. Yep. See I'm, I'm back before. I, even when I first started, I was at a two. Now I'm at a zero again. Like, <laughs> All right, so as you head over, um, the whole group is starting to catch up. Before Ymir and Ren get there, Akama, you've reached Pilgrim and Harmony, and um, at your approach, they both kind of... You wouldn't say that they were necessarily trying to hide anything, but they were having, you know, a conversation between two very close comrades, it appeared. And whatever they were talking about, they just... Honestly, you know, it did not seem to you. It seemed like they just kind of were like, okay, this isn't the right time to talk about this anymore. So they seem to finish their conversation up and turn and face you uh, at the same time. Um, and as they do, um, they both look kind of inquisitively as to what's what's happening. Um, as you approach them, what would you like to say? Uh, well, salutations, uh, fellow travelers. Uh, well, and then I say in kind of like a whispering tone, like, hey, uh, have you drank any of these drinks? Um, at this, Pilgrim lets out a, a little, just a little burst, a childlike burst of tittering laughter. And it comes out like these soft, sparkling kind of bells of silver. Uh, and it has this just intense effect on you where for just a moment you remember one of the most pleasant afternoons you had as a small child uh, with your clan and your family around you um, before some of the most horrific events that shaped you as a person had come to transpire. And you remember sitting on a majestic hill overlooking an ocean on a perfect sunny day, and, and the love that you feel from the family around you in that memory and the potency of the youth that you had in that moment, it, it overwhelms you. You actually feel yourself tear up for a moment. You take a deep breath in and try and steady yourself against this insane wave of emotion that hits you. Um, and after just a second, with your eyes wide and still feeling shocked, you realize this is just the effect of a small, earnest laughter from this, uh, earnest laugh from this being. Um, and you kind of snap back to your senses. Um, anyway, as you approach, uh, you can tell that the laugh after you're kind of able to, to regain your senses, you can tell that the laugh was in response to just the idea of drinking something from, from a being like that. You could tell that for Pilgrim that would be something she would never, never do. Does that make sense? She laughed in the same way a kid okay. would laugh if, if somebody said, hey, do you think it'd be okay for me to eat this piece of dog shit? Like it was that same kind of like, well, I, wow. would, never, I would never do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. At this, you see Harmony, um, you can tell on her face that the laughter had the same effect on her because her eyes actually roll up for just a second in in complete uh immersion in a very powerful memory and you you notice the effect as it wears off because she comes to her senses in real time in front of you and for just a second she gets a really broad smile across her face and looks down 
almost wanting to preserve the hold on that memory for an extra moment or two. Um, but as she acquiesces and relents uh, to history taking its proper place, she looks up at you um, with uh, uh, a shadow of that same smile on her face. Um, and you can tell that she very much agrees with Pilgrim, although she's amused by the response of Pilgrim as an outsider the same way you are. It, it's, it's amazing to her that she can have those kinds of effects on people, and that is playing across her expression as well right now. But in essence, you get the feeling that she's gently basically just agreeing with Pilgrim on this, that, yeah, probably not, you know. I reach both my agree. hands out. <laughs> I reach both my arms out and, like, put them uh, on each of their shoulders, and I say, you, thank you, you for that. Okay. All right. Did you just did you just dump your drink out? Who? You had a drink in your hand. You can't use both hands to reach out and put your hands on shoulders. That's a good thing drink. that I did not grab the drink. No, no, oh, no. Oh, you didn't. No, you did uh, take the drink. No, no. I didn't. Oh, you, I think I'm you confused. wanted to check with them. So. Yeah. See, 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 see. I thought I thought you got, I thought both of you guys had grabbed a drink. My bad. <laughs> so no, sir. So I right at this moment, the drink on their shoulder or something <laughs> behind yeah. their back, being like, "You guys just block me as I dump this out." So right at this moment, wow. as you as you do that, um, they both nod to you at the same time, and Ren and Ymir, you both step up into place, uh, completing kind of like a, a semicircle. Um, as you guys are all standing there, you two notice that. Uh, that Akama has just made that motion to these two, but you didn't really hear the interaction beforehand. Uh, you also weren't affected by the laughter as you weren't close enough. Um, so you guys are all standing around in a group now. Um, the valet seems to be retiring back uh, into a, a small uh, chamber to the rear of the room, um, apparently being satisfied with whatever interaction he had. Um you I'm quietly notice... say, oh, good. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to quietly say to the group, kind of just openly to the full group, not to anyone in particular. Um, I'm not sure if I offended, but uh, I refuse his offer of a beverage, and something happened to my arm, and I'm not sure if it was his doing. Uh, at this, Harmony looks over at you and she says, um, she says, I noticed the gift the Grand Master had given you. Does it have something to do with that? Um, I, 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 I it could be, it, it's, I feel like the. Okay, at this, she holds up say... one hand flat kind of towards you almost in a say-no-more gesture. She nods slowly and says, I must make you aware that the Grand Master's motives and means are beyond most of our mortal minds. Um, she shakes her head slightly and says, I know that sounds like rubbish, but I assure you, he sees through time as we see through air. Um, with this, she almost looks up and to the left for a moment, kind of trying to process something. And then she nods to herself and she says, perhaps it would be better said that he moves through time as we move through air. Um, with this, she shakes her head a little in, in um, <laughs> defeat and she says, all I mean is that he sees further than we do. And when you can come to trust him, you will understand that sometimes a gift will have more uh, utility and life of its own than you would first think. Um, and at this, she kind of bows her head a little bit and almost looks a little regretful. And she says, as do promises. Um, she shakes her head a little more and you can tell that something is really off about Harmony. There's something 
you don't know that it's just the death of the monk. There's there's something going on with her that's really really weighing on her. Uh, and at this ball patch on her head from all the fucking <laughs> at Again, this... like Cynthia from Rugrats. <laughs> at, <laughs> at this, she looks up and uh, and you can tell that she's her eyes are kind of shrink wrapped in tears and she's obviously having a lot of shit going on. And uh, she just kind of shakes her head and get in, again and says, I apologize. She says, um, um, she says it would be best for us to make our time here short um, as there are powerful forces that one does not necessarily benefit from coming in contact with. Um, she says, but I do have a bit of news. Um, at this, you all see Pilgrim actually bristle up and look kind of excited. A, uh, a slight smile creeps across her face, and her eyes kind of brighten. Um, she even makes a small clapping gesture with her hands like a child would. Um, you notice that Harmony at this kind of nods and smiles, seeing her happy, um, and then looks back at you and says, um, uh, I have been told um, that you... you have made enough of an impression um to receive uh support from my faction um she says um metadyne is willing to uh send uh, a low level agent with your group in order to assist you in your travels um as long as you are willing to complete one task uh she says this will be and an opportunity for one of our agents to work closely with your group and make sure that you would be a good fit for our organization. Um, she says, you are under no contract to join afterwards. It would, for your group, simply be extra help for the time being, um, as long as you agree uh, to this task. Um, she says, I can tell you that the mission uh, that you will be sent on um, will indeed be quite dangerous, but um, it will count towards the renown accumulation that we spoke of before. In fact, within Metadyne itself, this would almost guarantee a, a place at the table once the trials begin if you wish to try and represent, um, you know, Metadyne in the future. Um, so she looks over at Pilgrim and she kind of makes a, uh, you know, give me gesture and you see out of one of, uh, Pilgrim's kind of flowing, uh, pockets, uh, that she's, she's actually taken the top part of her, um, kind of utility suit that they were wearing and undone it and then folded it around at the waist tying the uh, sleeves and so she's got kind of like a, a just kind of real loose uh you know kind of blouse kind of like a flowing blouse underneath that you would guess is almost like a real kind of loose uh almost like a summer dress um and out of a small pocket on the side she pulls out this uh small it almost looks like a, a a cigar tube and it's made of just red plastic very basic and she unscrews the top and dumps the contents out into uh into harmony's hand and you see out pops a small rolled up piece of parchment very simple uh that on it has some uh some kind of language uh written out in in the form of a note um, Harmony grabs this, unfurls it, and starts reading it to you guys. Um, and she says, um, uh, I have been authorized by Metadyne's leading council to offer the services of one low-level agent to your group. Um, she clears her throat a little bit and tries to sound kind of official. And she says, in exchange for these services, uh, you will undertake one mission uh, 
requiring no longer than one week's time. Um, she says you will be compensated one million universal credits uh, to go towards expenses and uh, your time spent. Um, she says upon the conclusion of this contract, upon the positive resolution of this contract, um, further terms will be negotiated between parties um, and all outcomes will be considered fulfilled for the purposes of future negotiations. Um, with this, she just kind of rolls the paper back up and uh, she hands it to uh, you, Akama. Um, and she says, this is, this is your copy if you choose to accept it. Um, she says, uh, the information code is in the corner on the back. And um, as she hands it to you, you can tell that even though it's rolled up again, there's what essentially looks like a little, uh, you know, what are those called? The QED codes or whatever? You know what I'm talking QR about? QR codes. QR, QR codes. codes. Yeah, QR, well, yeah, yeah the, the small square ones. Um, yeah. There's yep. essentially yep. something like that that you can tell if you just put it through a, any kind of data processor, it's going to, you know give you some kind of more formal information. Um, you also see that on the very back um, that printed across the bottom next to that code is a small, almost like stamped name uh, that says Mission Contract Bitter Creep. Okay? Um, as she hands that over, um, she looks at you guys and she says, um, in addition, I think this may be an opportunity um, for even more benefit for your group. She holds a finger up, almost like telling everyone to hold on a second, and she nods to Pilgrim. Pilgrim quickly uh, uh, kind of half jogs and half runs um, over to one of the, the side... Uh, kind of chambers um, and within just a couple of seconds you can hear her conversing with something you can hear some voices coming from off behind uh, one of those alcoves um, Harmony looks back over at you guys and she says do you know if this would be something you would be interested with what we've spoken of so far Listening intently to what Harmony has been saying because he's he, she's speaking uh, in English, so he's been concentrated. That's why he's been, been quiet. Ymir finally pipes up and he speaks to her in slow English and goes, Harmony, will this raven that they send with us be trustworthy? Ymir trusts Harmony. Ymir trusts Akama. Ymir trusts Ren. Ymir, and his voice trails off as you could almost, everyone knows who he's thinking about as his voice trails off for a second. And then he kind of shakes it off. Right on, and right on. He, he connects to, he connects, he finds himself again and goes, Ymir, will Ymir have to watch this? person this raven or will they be an honorable warrior okay at this she kind of scans each one of your faces trying to see if you guys are all on the same page with this because you you guys get the impression that's exactly what she'd be worried about and as she kind of looks across at each of you, um, she kind of puts her head down for a second and just thinks about it. And then she looks up at you, Ymir, and she says, I don't know him well enough to vouch for him. Even if I did, I wouldn't. I don't believe in that kind of thing. I've been betrayed by those closer than family. And... It means nothing what I recommend anyways. There's no reason for you to trust me yet. But I will tell you this. 
the power level of the agent that they wish to assign to your group is nothing compared to the rest of you. And at this, she looks around at each of you and you can tell she's being completely serious. Um, she says it would be an extra set of hands and uh, hopefully in addition to your uh, numbers and firepower for the coming conflict, um, which from my understanding would be uh, not necessary, but helpful. Um, she says, I believe you are all very capable in your own right. Um, she says, but stacked against any of the three of you individually, um, she says, I am sure that you would easily triumph over this agent. Um, she says, because of that, I would, I would say that the risk is rather low. Um, but that is only how I would assess a situation like this. So it's the only offering of advice that I can give. You speak soundly, warrior. I appreciate your insight. And Yabir nods his head respectfully at her. Okay, she nods at this. No, and, and no, Knowing that he's going, if that's the path they go, knowing he's going to have to keep his eye on this person that they send with him. Okay. All right. Um, she nods at that, and actually you can tell she appreciates that you're, you know, wanting advice on this from from her and she kind of reaches out and claps you on the on the well the forearm normally it'd be like the shoulder but you know the wrist forearm. i guess at work yep. so you by the way yep. you're very much enjoying being able to stand up fully um most of the places you go it, it when it comes to mortals um and regular folk yeah, you don't even really get to go inside. So this is this is really nice for you to have a place that's built for large beings. Um, Indeed. Let's see. You all see pilgrims uh, start coming back. Go ahead. I look. I look at Harmony and I ask if there's a possibility if I can use that uh, container that had the scroll. Uh, she. Uh, she nods and says, yes, absolutely. And she uh, very quickly closes it with her thumb and hands it over to you. And then I reach out my fist and I say, pound it. Nice. Um, all right. As you do, uh, she goes ahead and gives you a little dap there. And then she, she looks over and as she's watching Pilgrim come back, um, you notice that her face gets a little, she gets a little bit of, uh, worry across her face. Um, as harmony or, or pilgrim Har harmony, as you know, okay. as you guys all notice together, um, that she's actually returning with this being. Is this supposed to be our low level partner? In no, no. Okay. That's like, a. <laughs> you adeptus <laughs> dominus <laughs> so um, as she returns back to the group you see this uh, creature uh, hauntingly floating across the stone floor uh, over towards you as well book still open and still apparently scanning through the voluminous tomb that seems to be kind of emitting like a soft glow and some smoke and haze um, his uh, facial glow um is pretty bright right now and you're not sure if that's a sign of agitation or what exactly but um you do notice that the light coming from the symbols uh along his adornments um it that seems to be flaring kind of brightly as well and you all wonder if that means that this being is somehow engaged in a in a pretty impressive expenditure of power or if it's just the way it normally looks none of you seem to remember it being that expressive before um they return over basically right next to each other and as this being takes up a position in front of you guys um it, it doesn't even really look up from its book it has a haunting 
um, kind of echoing voice uh, that rings out clearly to each of you. And Ymir, you notice that you're able to understand this being perfectly, um, although you don't think that it's from uh, an audible source. Um, All of you right away recognize that it appears that this thing is speaking directly into your mind. Um, You hear this echoey voice uh, ring out saying, um, a contract is available to your group. Who speaks for you? And then it pauses and waits. Um, At this, Pilgrim and Harmony both step back from your group several paces, allowing you all to deal with this yourselves. I point that and run. I go (laughs) super big eyed here because I've been waiting, trying to ask uh, Harmony something this entire time and not found a moment to do it. And now I'm confronted with you pointing at me saying that I'm responsible for us when I've got a billion questions. And I'll just go. Well, if you, if you want, man, you can, you can make everything wait. You could just lean over to her and I mean, you don't, you know, Okay, yeah, then I'll be like, um, could you uh, kind of give um, a comma a look like, fuck you, dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> fine, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll take you, it. May, may I have a moment, please? And I'll kind of motion Harmony, just kind of like, can I? And... Uh, at this, she just looks a little surprised and kind of like, oh, yeah, and she just kind of steps over to you and leans in, kind of like, what's what's up? Um, you mentioned that we've been accepted and that this task would be kind of our entry to your group, but it's not required. And then that you would be assigning one of your own to assist. And then upon Ymir asking if we can trust this person, you shed a bit of light by saying that you don't trust, or you wouldn't trust, or you can't promise the trust from anyone, which to me is very much a reality. Um, I as much as I would love to trust you who have helped us immensely, I I don't have a trust for even my two friends here completely. I I, I don't trust people. um, Where I grew up, uh, I might not know much about the grand scheme of things in this world. I very, I know very little, Um, but my family, where I grew up, where they were very dishonest people. And I've been thrust into this situation where I'm seeing creatures that look like they mean you ill intent, offer you things that don't look appealing. And they don't seem to be hiding anything yet they genuinely seem to be like, here is something, just have it. Where, I don't know, my entire life I've grown up with people who have either tried to play the part of deceiving you for them, for, for you to take something that would be ill intent, or if not them looking themselves the part, disguising the object they are giving you to play that part of something that's appealing, seems innocent, Okay, she stops you. She stops you. She puts her hands on the side of your face, one hand on each side. Kind of I very... recoil because I'm weird about being touched. Okay, as you start recoiling, she just puts a hand out to kind of stop you. It's just, just just calm down. She says, calm down. What is it you want to know? Specifically, ask me a question. There are these a constant flow of these beings that seem to have slight interest in us that I have 
no idea of their motivation, of their reason for be even no noticing us. And I feel like every single one of them has an ulterior motive, and I can't figure any of it out. And that's driving me insane, this constant unknowing of where I'm at, what I'm doing, and why these things are even batting an eye in our direction. These beings that seem that they could blink and we would cease to exist. And so she looks a little confused and she says, so you're asking why these beings are taking notice of you? It's not. I guess I don't know if you are from a place where you had humble beginnings and started and grew up, got thrown into something, but that's very much at, how at I this. Am. She barks out a, a savage peal of laughter and very, <laughs> very quickly nods her head and says, indeed, indeed. So what I'm saying is. Everything I'm doing is purely against what I would rationally think I would do. But since everything is so alien and outlandish and crazy to me in the first place, I don't have a state of reference almost. I would never agree to go on this crazy ship where a giant creature that we can't even see from outside is possibly going to destroy it, but I would never go into a radioactive-filled basement reactor to save a town of strangers who all look like wet cigars, but it's kind of the path I've just been put on, and I can't see 